joining us today on the Word Made Plain. If this is your first time viewing this broadcast today, please text FTG21 to 615-751-5495. Also, please like, share, and subscribe to our channel to be sure you receive future video notifications.
Welcome to Olive Branch Church, where our mission is to create a vibrant community that emphasizes enrichment, excellence, and fellowship. We are so excited that you have tuned into The Word Made Plain with Pastor Dr. Vincent L. Windrow Sr. today. We hope that you're impacted, empowered, and enlightened through the Word of God. Let's join Pastor Windrow as he delivers today's message. All right, all right, all right, all right. You know what it is. You know who it is. You know where it is. What is it? It is, what is it? it, it, it it's, it's Bible study. It's Bible study time. Who is it? It's, it, it's me, Pastor Vinny. Where is it? The Olive Branch Church here in Nashville, Tennessee. Thank you so very much for tuning in. How was your day? It was a little rainy on, on this side of the world, a little bit rainy. Now, yesterday, on yesterday, the sun was out. It was warm. I thought about doing a little jogging, but I remember that I didn't feel like jogging on that day, so I didn't on that day. Thought about doing it on this day where I said, uh, raining outside. So I didn't get to jog on yesterday or today. It won't, maybe not uh, tomorrow either. But today is Wednesday. Today is Wednesday, and you have been blessed to overcome some stuff in order to tune in this evening. Thank you so very much for being here. God bless you. I hope this past weekend was to your liking. I hope everything is going smoothly. And if not, understand that there are lessons in the not so smooth times in as much as there are lessons in the smooth time. Now, I am not a uh, subscriber to, uh, to the idea that you only learn during hard times. I believe you learn during all times if you are a student. Amen, amen. Now, somebody take that and run with it now. Write a book on it, a poem, a song, or something, a sermon, or something. Do something, do something with that. I'll say it again for those in the back. I'm not a subscriber to the idea that you only learn during hard times. I believe you can learn during all times if you are a, what? A student. Am I right or am I right? I am right. So, whoo, that was a mouthful. How y'all doing? God bless you so very much. So, so again, welcome to uh, Wednesday Night Bible Study. I do have a couple of announcements before we dive. Was that a dive? Before we dive into our continuing study about they wrote them, we sing them. That's right. I put a title on this thing. They wrote them, we sing them. So the first announcement is we have continued our partnership with the Fish House in Murfreesboro, which means that on tomorrow, that's Thursday, between the hours of 9 and 11 a.m., 9 and 11 a.m., we will be distributing groceries. Groceries. It's, it's our groceries giveaway. It'll be at the Fish House. Let me get that address for you. It's 1626 Middle Tennessee Boulevard. That is the Fish House. JoJo Herbert's joint. JoJo Herbert's place. The Fish House. Our groceries giveaway tomorrow between the hours of 9 and 11. Groceries giveaway. Amen. So, the next announcement is regarding our in-person worship and when we will restart it. Well, let me tell you, it won't be in February. It will not be this month. Amen. We have continued to monitor the, situ monitor the situation. There have been certain spikes in the school systems, uh, and we just don't feel comfortable with providing an opportunity for you to come, for us to come, amen, for us to come and have in-person worship when the stakes are so high regarding your health and your well-being. And the numbers are, are, are trending in the right way sometimes, right? And so we just have to remain a little, a, a, a little cool on this, cool in terms of don't get ahead of ourselves, don't put the cart before the horse, allow those numbers to come down and continue to trend in a downward fashion instead of this up and down trend that, that we've seen for the last three or four weeks. So please, ma'am, please, sir, understand that as usual, your well-being is what we are trying to protect and really trying to encourage. Amen. So continue, wherever you are, continue to wear masks, continue to wash your hands, continue 
to uh, physically distance yourself as you are led to. Uh, if you have not received the vaccine or uh, the boost, please uh, consider, to consider doing that. It is part of our contribution to the cause, our contribution to the community, our contribution to the collection. Amen. So please stay tuned. So let me say that again. For the entirety of this month, we will not have in-person worship, in, in worship. We will continue our online streaming exclusively of our 10 o'clock worship service. I look forward to seeing you in person one of these days. Let me tell you, it's, it's, it's more than a few of y'all that I haven't seen in almost two years. It's crazy to me that I, I am used to seeing y'all Sunday in and Sunday out and Sunday in and, and Sunday out. And I, for many of y'all, for, for us, we have not seen each other like in person, like face to face, like dap to dap, like hug to hug in almost two years. I'm looking forward to the day that we can see each other, dap each other, hug each other, hug each other. But until that day, until that time, please, ma'am, please, sir, be well and stay safe. Amen. Okay, so a, a, as you know, this is our They Wrote Them, We Sing Them. Talking about hymns. I'm talking about legendary hymns. I'm not talking about Kurt Franklin. I'm not talking about nothing like that. I'm talking about legendary hymns. I'm talking about hymns in the hymn book. I'm talking about those songs in the hymn book. In the hymn book, you know, the ones you used to write in when you was a little kid, put uh, 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 chewing gum wrapping paper, sometimes chewing gum in those books, draw pictures of the pastor in those books. I know who you are. I know who you are. So we want to go back and grab some of those hymns, but not just the songs, not just the hymns themselves, but the stories behind the hymns. Amen. I'm talking about who wrote them, what provoked that person, that author to write those hymns. We started off with William Cooper. Uh, last time we talked about John Newton. Cooper wrote uh, uh, Praise for the Fountain Open or what do we call that? Um, what do we call that? Uh, Bethany! Uh, what, what's the other name of that song that William Cooper wrote? There is a fountain filled with blood. Thank you so very much. And then we moved on to John Newton, who wrote Amazing Grace. What we have done, and I want you to follow it, what we have done is we've introduced the author. We've given background, the backstory, the backdrop on the author. And then the next Wednesday, we have looked at the hymn itself. We, we, we've looked at the theology of the hymn. We've looked at the history of the hymn. All of that, the hymn, but it's the, it's the him and the her first and then, <laughs> then the him, right? And, and, and so that's what we'll also do tonight. We'll introduce the author tonight or the writer tonight, the lyricist tonight. And then next Wednesday, we will look at the him itself. Before we move any further, let us pray. God, in your infinite wisdom, your divine providence, God, you have guided us to this point, not just in today, but in our lives, God. Nothing that you have done or performed has been an accident, God. It has not been by happenstance or by coincidence, God. It is God incidents that have happened in our lives. Thank you, God, for allowing us to intersect with the lives of so many wonderful people, so many awe-inspiring people, so many kind people, so many people who you have chosen and used to bless our lives. God, we thank you for strength. We thank you for power and might, God. We thank you for your love and kindness towards us. We thank you for this time. Bless it, bless us in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. So, when we are considering uh, this study, I, I, I want you to, to catch this. I want you to pick up what I'm putting down. We want to look at three things in particular. I'm talking about three major 
headings, right? One major heading is, is regarding uh, the personal struggles. The personal struggles of the writer. Why should we consider the personal struggles of the writer? Uh, one example or one reason is, is that sometimes we disconnect the successful person from their personhood. What, 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 what we know is a person can be brilliant and yet broken at the same time. What we know is that a person can be talented yet troubled at the same time. But in so many instances, in so many cases, when we consider those who have ascended, those who have climbed, those who have succeeded, those who have, 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 are on a certain rung on the ladder of success, we consider them extra human. We, we consider them to be something different than us as if they have no struggles, as if they have no troubles, as if they have no pain, as if they've never been sick. It's almost, it's us over here and they're over there and nothing that applies to us applies to them, but that is unfair. Not only is it unfair to them, it's unfair to us. Yes, it's unfair to us. When we humanize the successful, we begin to see that, hey, wait a minute. If they, with all of their troubles, all of their struggles, all of their sacrifices, everything that has, that has happened in their lives, if they can then succeed, what about us? What about us? And I believe it's a trick of the enemy to, to coax us into separating the successful ones from the masses of the people. Why would the enemy not want us to acknowledge the humanity of the successful ones? Why would the enemy want that? It's so that we wouldn't fulfill our own potential. We would not pursue. We would not climb. We would not reimagine. Why? Because we would think by separating the successful from the masses of us, by, by doing that, 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 that's just for them and they're, they're special. But we, we have to be mired or, or, or caught up or stuck in this, that we have to be mired in this, in this miserable place that, that average is for us, that medio mediocrity is our thing. That, that there is a mountain and we can, we, we can only really climb up half the mountain, right? And so we don't get out of us what God has deposited within us. So what I'm trying to do, one of the aims of this study is to humanize, is to bring those people to be amongst us so that we can learn not just that they were successful, but they were also human that things happen to them things happen for them and things happen because of them so this fits very nicely within our uh, sermonic framework within how we message our uh, understanding of the bible uh, uh, how we approach the scriptures it, it, it fits right nicely in, in how we've been doing this for 22 years right that, that not, not, we are not the only ones who struggle. We're not the only ones who have been afflicted, right? Every human being has. And yet, some have risen above that misery. Some have risen above that pain. And I believe if they can do it, we can do it too. That's my testimony. That is what I believe. That's one of the things. That's not the only thing I believe, but I certainly believe that, people of God. If somebody can do it, somebody else can do it. How do I know the evidence is obvious? Because somebody else has done it. Amen, amen. Somebody else has come out of poverty. Somebody else who, have, who was born into wedlock or out of wedlock has moved on in their lives. So, so people of God, brothers and sisters, let us bring everybody, lay them on the table and examine not just their successes, but their troubles as well. So that's one thing. 
We want to look at the personal struggles. We also want to examine their attitudes towards black people. Why would we want to examine their attitudes towards black people? Because we want to understand how they viewed black people, how they aided and supported black people, or how they did not, how they disliked, how they hated, how they considered black people to be inferior. Not to take away anything from the hymns that they wrote, but to rather have a more, have a have a fuller view of that person and not just know these uh, highfalutin things about them, but to look at the personhood of the writer. All right, all right. So, so, so one, we have the personal struggles. Two, we have attitudes towards black people and as a predominantly black church, I, I think it's part of our uh, educational process to understand these things. In a time when something like critical race theory, which I have never studied, and I got all those degrees, I have 563 books on black history at my, in my home, in my private library, and none of them mention critical race theory. And, and, and there is a national uh, thrust against critical race theory being taught in elementary schools when it wasn't taught at MTSU, when it wasn't taught at American Baptist College, when it wasn't taught at Tennessee State University when I attended those schools, and we're having that conversation. It's a straw man. That's what it is. But, well, but that, well, we'll get to that on, on, a, on another occasion. Personal struggles, attitudes towards black people. And famous hymns, the famous hymns that they have written. So we have three major categories, right? So, so let, 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 let's get to it. So let's look at the personal struggles of Fanny Crosby. Fanny, Fanny Crosby, Fanny Crosby, born 1820, died at almost 95 years of age. She lived a long time, saw a whole bunch of stuff. And she was blind. Now, here is what happened. Her, 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 her dad had previously been married, but that wife died, leaving her dad with a daughter, right? So her dad then marries her mom. They produce Fanny Crosby. When Fanny Crosby is only six months old, six months old, half a year, her father dies. I tell you what, the first three authors that we've looked at, we looked at William Cooper, <coughs> excuse me, William Cooper, we looked at John Newton. William Cooper's mama died having his Brother John, right? John and William were the only two out of the seven of their, of their parents' children who lived beyond childhood. What about John Newton? His mama died at a very, very early age, with like, like he was six or seven years old. And so now we have Fanny Crosby whose father dies, not her mother, her father dies when she's only six months, six months old. Prior, prior to her daddy dying, Fanny Crosby catches a cold and she has inflammation on her eyes, right? So, so a, a treatment is placed on her eyes and, and she is blind. Now, history says that she blamed what was put on her eyes to treat the inflammation. But modern day researchers suggest that she was already blind 
but her parents just did not notice that she was blind. When she was five, a doctor said that they could not operate on her eyes and her blindness was permanent. So she's blind. Talking about personal struggles, she's blind. Then her father dies. Now, consider the challenges faced in 2022 uh, by folks who cannot see, who do not have sight. Think about after all uh, the measures and the legislation that has been put in place, the laws that have been passed, the access that has been provided, the support that has been uh, and service that has been rendered. Consider still how challenging it is for those who cannot see. In the year 2022. And now think about in the early 1800s. How challenging, how challenging it may have been or how it probably was for someone to live as a blind person. And then on top of that, for a female to live in society as a blind person, a person who had no sight. Fanny Crosby experienced some personal struggles and personal tragedy. Thanks be to God that her mama and her mama's mama, that means her mother and her grandmother, her mama on her mama's side, her maternal grandmother, they took her in and they were fervent, devout Christians. And they raised her up in Christianity. Now, now Fanny Crosby, she had this way of memorizing things. So by the time she was 15, she, she could recite. She couldn't read them. She couldn't write them, but she could recite them. She could recite Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. She could recite the first five books, the Pentateuch of the Old Testament, the Song of Solomon. She could also recite the book of Proverbs and some of the Psalms. She was a smarty, wasn't she? I'm talking about highly intelligent. She could do it. Now, right before she was 15 years old, they sent her to New, the New York Institute for the Blind. There, she stayed for 23 years, about half the time as a student and about half the time as a teacher. That, there is where she began to write and 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 write some more. It has been suggested that Fanny Crosby wrote over 8,000 hymns and gospel songs. Over 8,000 religious oriented songs, a thousand more secular poems. I'm talking about she was a writer, a prolific writer. I'm talking about she generated a whole bunch of writing. She was a writer's writer. Unfortunately for Fanny Crosby, being blind, being a woman, being vulnerable, she never received the type of compens compensation for her songs that many believe she should have. As a matter of fact, she only received one or two dollars per song or per poem. One or two dollars, if they were generous, for each piece that she wrote. Now, think about what you have heard about the recording industry, particularly the publishing arm of the recording industry. How many sad tales have we heard 
of people being gypped, being ripped off by publishing companies, right? Artists, lyricists, writers, right? Having been uh, manipulated and never receiving the type of royalties that they should have. Now, that's today. It still goes on today. I was just reading something. Uh, uh, Spotify, what, what do they get? A penny per play? What does that mean? If somebody streams your song, I'm talking about your song, your song, or, or my song, Bright Eyed and Bushy Tail, Bright Eyed and Bushy Tail, is how my grandma said I should approach each day of life. In the middle of my yawning, when I woke up just this morning, I thought to take a look outside. There he was, the sun was shining, and to me gently reminding, I had a purpose to fulfill. Well, I ain't going to get on all the song, but you get the gist of it, don't you? That, 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 if that song was on Spotify, and I'm talking about if 100 people would stream that song, I would get about a dollar. Now, what year is this? 2022? Am I right or am I right? I'm right about that. I've been wrong at least two times in the last 10 years, but I know I'm right about that. It is 2022. Think about how unfair the publishing was, the copyright uh, uh, habits, tradition, practices were back then in the mid-1800s, right? Here, here is another fun fact. The writer of the song did not receive the copyright. The composer of the tune typically received the copyright. Now, what does that mean? I just sit up there and told you I wrote Bright Eyed and Bushy Tail. But if somebody back then would have wrote the music to Bright Eyed and Bushy Tail, they would receive the copyright to that music. I would be paid, in this case, one or two dollars, like Fanny Crosby, and that would be it for me. So, Fanny Crosby, Crosby is blind. Yes, she is. She's blind. She's a woman. And she experienced all of those kinds of struggles that you can imagine. Fanny Crosby also was a strong abolitionist, meaning that she was anti-slavery, spoke out about the ills and the evil of slavery. Not only that, she wrote tunes, songs for the Union Army. She was patriotic, believed that black people should be free. Not only that, she lived for the majority of her adult life among the poor. Part of her mission in life, in addition to writing, was rescue missions. And so, so she would serve the people there when she would receive the little small amount from her writing or from an honorarium. She took what only she needed to survive on and donated the rest to rescue missions, uh, the majority of them in large urban cities. Fanny Crosby was just not a hymn writer or a gospel song writer. She was a believer in the Lord Jesus Christ and the social justice that Jesus Christ not only taught but exemplified. He modeled it. So Fanny Crosby in my book is a good one. Yeah, she's, 
she's a good one. But what about her writings? Now, I took and told you that she wrote about 8,000 hymns and gospel songs, 1,000 secular poems, a couple autobiographies. She was a writer now. She was a writer. Listen to this. It has been said that she wrote so many hymns that the publishers of the hymnals didn't want to include all that she wrote because they didn't want folk to think that it was just a hymnal with all her songs in it. So what did she do? It, it, it's, it's said that she, has, she had over uh, 200 false names, that she went under some false names just to get her hymns in those hymn books because the publishers would not include them because they would have taken up all the book. How about that? Fanny Crosby. Well, Fanny Crosby, what about her famous hymns? Now, we know that John Newton's most famous hymn is Amazing Grace. We know that there is a fountain filled with blood is William Cooper's most famous him. What about Fanny Crosby, the queen of gospel songwriters? What about her? Well, have you heard about or ever sung? Have you, have you ever sung Blessed Assurance? Fanny Crosby. What, what about Jesus keep me near the cross? Fanny Crosby. What about pass me not, oh gentle? Well, I ain't got my good voice on tonight. Uh, I, I was singing Bright Eyed and Bushy Tail with too high, too high. If I hadn't been singing it too high, I would have come on down with pass me not, O oh gentle Savior, Fanny Crosby. Now, I'm just, I, just, I just gave you three of the most popular hymns that have ever been sung in this church. I believe in any church. And I'm talking about Olive Branch stretches back to 1875. It's a long time. And I'm, what I'm taking and telling you is that pass me not, O oh gentle Savior, blessed assurance, and Jesus keep me near the cross. Can you find better hymns than that? And listen to this. Those three hymns were written by the same person. Who was that person? None other than Fanny Crosby. Woo! She was someone. She, she was something. A prolific writer. A believer in social justice. Blind, vulnerable, but determined. I look forward to seeing you back here on Wednesday night, 7 o'clock that is, on Wednesday, as we look at one of these hymns. I'm going to give you an opportunity I'm going to give you this opportunity. We're going to choose which one of these three hymns we're going to look at on Wednesday. Now, you have the opportunity. Will it be, Pass Me Not, O Gentle Savior, written in response to her visit to a prison? How about that? I'm telling you she was part of this social justice movement. Or will it be blessed assurance? Or will it be Jesus keep me near the cross? I'll get your votes in. I'm talking about right now. I'm talking about put it in that chat. Put it in that chat right now. Which one do you want for next Wednesday? Pass me not, O oh gentle Savior. Blessed assurance or Jesus keep me near the cross. You put it in the chat and I'll see you right back here. Same time, same place, same day of the week. God bless you. Until we see each other again. Hallelujah. You've been listening to The Word Made Plain with Pastor Dr. Vincent L. Windrow Sr. Thank you for tuning in, and we'll see you right here next week. For questions about this broadcast or general questions about our church, call us at 615-941-1268 or email us at churchadmin at olivebranchchurch.org.